Okay, so um, uh, welcome to our next in series of CPD in 43, uh, which is from Savills Planning and Regeneration Update uh, from Garen and Sean of Savills. Um, thank you uh, for doing the talk with, with us today. Um, it's, uh, as everyone knows, it's, it runs for the lunchtime. Um, we have, we will hand it straight over to them very shortly. Um, they'll do a presentation for 30, 40 minutes odd, um, and then we'll have a Q&A session towards the latter end of the talk. And obviously at the end, I'll just run through and thank our speakers. Um, as you can see here, um, we have a couple of uh, events leading us up to the end of the year. We've got an event from Autodesk, the journey from design to auto, uh, from design automation to gen generative design on Wednesday 13th of October. Please do sign up to that. That should be released on um, Eventbrite. Um, and we've got a, another talk which is from Hydroc, uh, which is again, this is all part of our CPD and 43 series. Um, same time, same day, uh, just different date. Um, fire safety design, current design, current guidance and legislation and common design issues. That should be extremely interesting. So I do encourage everyone to sign up to that. Um, the specialists in the area uh, that will be going through legislation, upcoming changes, um, uh, and actually, funnily enough, uh, there's obviously the p planning gateway um, elements that obviously Garen and uh, Sean uh, could potentially touch on as well. Um, so that's on Wednesday, the 17th of November. Um, so without further ado, I will hand it straight over to uh, our speakers today. Um, likewise, uh, as usual, I'll be in the background uh, fielding the chat box. Please do ask any questions and we'll field them uh, towards the end of the talk. That's great. No, thank you very much, Isman. Um, and um, yeah, let me just share my screen if I may. Uh, so just uh, hopefully you can see all of that. So um, yeah, like I said, thank you very much, Usman, and uh, thanks all for, for, for joining us today uh, for uh, the, uh, this planning and regeneration update uh, to SEAT Wessex uh, for today's uh, CPD in 43 uh, presentation. Uh, my name is uh, Sean Lewis, and I'll be with my, uh, my director, Geraint Jones, uh, here this afternoon to present uh, a little bit about me. Um, so I've been at Savills for, for two and a half years. Um, and I get involved with a, a range of jobs really, so from uh, smaller class Q schemes, farm conversions to, to uh, some out of town retail, um, uh, out of town retail projects and uh, some strategic uh, land promotions as well, uh, including uh, some of the case studies uh, that you may, you will see uh, on, on the screen uh, today. Afternoon, everybody. Uh, so I'm Geraint Jones, um, a colleague of Sean's. I'm a director in the planning team in Bristol. Uh, so I started my career working, I well, worked always in the southwest, but uh, it was more rurally based. So I worked out of Star and Chester until 2015 when I relocated to the Savills uh, Bristol office. Um, my specialisms, uh, I deal with uh, probably more focused on day-to-day -day planning rather than major strategic, although Sean and I are working on strategic projects together, which we'll touch on in a second. Uh, but it, it's a range of residential, um, uh, commercial, industrial, uh, but we also do quite a bit of estate holding work uh, supporting uh, our rural businesses within Savills. Uh, we just wanted to highlight a couple of uh, examples of schemes that Sean and I have worked on just so you can get an understanding for the range. Uh, so going from very small scale, so individual properties, so I was very recently involved in what was known uh, as a paragraph 79 dwelling, I believe the latest MPPF has changed that to paragraph 80, but these, for those that don't know, are sort of the grand design style schemes, uh, so approaching with specific uh, angles as to why they're, they're special uh, and should be allowed in the countryside where you wouldn't normally be allowed uh, to build a new residential property, apart from specific sort of agricultural uses and uh, uses more specific to the countryside. Um, touching on which, uh, Sean's got a, a proposal he's been involved with, which is a class Q scheme that he mentioned. So uh, I, I'm sure many of you have come across these before. Uh, some authorities, they're easier to secure than others. There's definitely a political angle to these, even though there shouldn't be. 
Um, and then we go right up to a uh, much larger scale, uh, so urban regeneration projects. So what you're seeing before you there is uh, is a large student, well, predominantly student scheme uh, in behind the Temple Meads, linked to the new Bristol University campus. So that's uh, a well advanced uh, proposal. The only thing yet to be resolved is uh, flood risk, which is currently hamstringing that area, uh, while the Environment Agency and BCC uh, battle with each other about what should and shouldn't be allowed to happen at this point in time. Uh, there are obviously the EA looking at 100 years into the future and uh, uh, and what may come there. Um, and also, uh, Sean and I are both working on a, a proposals for a new settlement in Worcestershire. Uh, so this is known as Worcestershire Parkway uh, because it's adjacent to the new train stations lived there uh, within the last few years. Uh, that's relatively early stages in terms of what the public will be aware of. Um, but uh, it just gives you a feel for the scale. So that would be in ultimately a 10,000 unit scheme and we're responsible for a, a parcel which would probably be in the region of about 2,000 houses and uh, major industrial development as well. Um, so if we want to move on to the main presentation. Thanks, Geraint. Um, so that was just a flavour of some of the work that we, we uh, undertake at the moment. So uh, as you can see uh, there, this presentation will cover uh, the four topics, uh, including an overview of uh, the government's reforms, the use classes order, uh, permitted development rights, uh, and some of the latest uh, changes and movements this summer. Uh, we'll also be looking at uh, this summer's amendments to the National Planning Policy Framework uh, as well, uh, as well as uh, just a general overview uh, of uh, planning matters in the southwest of England and uh, nationwide across, across uh, England uh, and Wales. So uh, just uh, moving on, so the, first, the use classes order being the first uh, item that we'll be covering today. So just to provide a, a general overview, um, this time last year, uh, the government overhauled the, 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 uh, the use classes order, essentially changing uh, the classes and categories to which different types of properties and land fall into. Um, those uh, retained by the government comprised uh, B2 industrial and B8 storage and distribution, so your logistics warehouses um, and all uh, the and additional uses uh, retained by the government included uh, the C class uses, um, i.e. those residential uses, care homes, uh, HMOs and hotels. Um, the reforms last year also got rid of the A-class uses, so your, your shops, your restaurants, uh, and also use class B1, uh, offices and employment, uh, other employment uses, as well as uh, D1 and D2, so your D-class uses um, being uh, non-residential uh, institutions and leisure facilities. Um, these uh, revoked uses so were uh, subsumed into new or expanded use classes um, comprising those uh, that you can see there. So uh, class E being commercial business and service uses, um, which includes uh, alongside, you know, uh, retail, cafes and restaurants, offices uh, and gyms, which were formed part of uh, the previous separate use classes. Uh, class F, which are more community based uses um, categorised by uh, F1, being uh, learning and non-residential institutions, and also uh, F2 being uh, your traditional uh, community uses, community halls, meeting places, um, uh, and some places for, for outdoor sports. Um, there was uh, a few, so the sui generis uh, youth class was expanded also uh, to include those uses which can at times be a little unsociable, uh, and can uh, impact residential amenity. Um, so that those include now include bars uh, and pubs and uh, hot food takeaways, as you can see there. So if we can just provide a, a little bit of an overview of the use classes system, it's a bit of a busy page and I, I might just add that we will be uh, sharing the slides uh, following this, uh, this, this webinar today. Um, but uh, hopefully that can be a, a useful point of reference for you this afternoon. Okay. 
So if we move on to the Mr. Jordan, right? Okay, just moving on to the, uh, there's a couple of permitted development rights we just wanted to touch on with you. Uh, there's quite a few opportunities here, particularly focus on uh, residential. Um, uh, now, the, this is sort of a, a constantly evolving system. Um, the first one I want to touch on is part 20, schedule two, and this is one which uh, would seemingly it got quite a lot of media coverage. But actually, in our team of, sort of 15, 16 planners in Bristol, I don't think I think we're yet to, to deal with with one of these ourselves. So it'd be interesting to hear whether uh, any of you as practitioners uh, have managed to find sites where this is appropriate. Um, so just talking through. So as part of the government's agenda to boost the supply of new homes, it brought in new permitted development rights. And that's related to extensions going up to two storeys above existing buildings uh, and also allows for some associated operations that you would deliver alongside that. Um, so these comprise classes which you can see on screen here. Um, as you may already be aware, a subject, each of the classes subject to their own requirements, restrictions and conditions. And uh, before uh, coming on today, I printed off the, uh, the legislation as a quick reminder to refresh myself. And there's 30 pages of legislation and um, criteria associated with the three that we're talking about today. So, as you can see, it, it's a rabbit warren that you can quickly disappear down. So, happy to answer more detailed questions after outside of this presentation uh, for anyone that needs assistance. Um, in terms of the areas where it applies, so the changes exclude uh, those on Article 23 land. Um, including world, world heritage sites, so for example, City of Bath, areas of outstanding natural beauty like the Cotswolds and conservation areas. Uh, and to add the changes also cannot be undertaken on listed buildings. That's another exclusion. So this is why you've got to uh, understand the detail that sits behind it. When you're looking at a site, there's, there's a lot of tick boxes to work through. Uh, I think that's part of the reason why we, we've not seen any come forward. We've seen, we have seen people asking questions about sites, we're yet to find a site where this works from a viability perspective. Um, uh, these are all subject to prior approval processes uh, with the council assessing individual proposals against a list of criteria. So that can include amenities of neighbouring premises and fire safety of external walls on buildings over 18 metres. Uh, so it's another area where you've got to understand that detail uh, Permitted development is seen as something where if you tick the box, it should be allowed to happen. These all have prior approval processes associated with them, which means to a degree there is an element of interpretation from the local authority when you are putting proposals forward. Um, Sean, do you want to move on to the uh, next slide? Yeah, OK, so um, it's worth uh, checking in with uh, class ZA also, um, which uh, subject to prior approval uh, grants uh, permission for the demolition of certain detached uh, purpose-built blocks of flats or de uh, detached office buildings um, and the construction of either a replacement um, detached purpose-built blocks of flats or a single dwelling house which um, in some cases may may work but usually the, the former um, uh, notable uh, requirements uh, of the most notable for, uh, sort of uh, qualification requirements uh, include that the existing building has to be vacant for at least uh, six months uh, and has been and has not been rendered unsafe or un otherwise uh, un uninhabitable by the action or inaction of the owner. This is the, the legislation that we're uh, we're talking uh, about. Um, the footprint of the existing building uh, does not exceed 1000 square metres and that is gross. Um, and the existing building uh, must have been constructed before uh, the 31st of December 1989. Um, there are additional uh, requirements as well uh, and as Garen said it's it's useful to to get behind uh, the detail uh, of, of those PD rights in the event that you would like to utilise uh, class ZA and the other uh, options uh, presented uh, this afternoon. So uh, class ZA can be uh, delivered on the condition that uh, no part of the footprint of the new building falls outside of the old building, so it can't extend beyond uh, the, the, the footprint. Um, 
the, the height of the new building uh, does not exceed the lower of uh, seven meters above the height of the old building or 18 meters in total. Uh, note that that does not include uh, associated plant and masts. Um, and also the new building has no more than two, two stories taller than the original building. So say you've got a three story building there, you cannot go on and build a, a six story building, um, but also it may get caught up in the, the 18 meter rule as well. So uh, as with the, the previous use classes, and as I said at the beginning of this, this slide, um, proposals under class ZA are subject to a private approval process as well. Um, so the, the local authority will assess the scheme against a number of uh, criteria, uh, including those listed on uh, the screen there. Uh, the most, one, some of the more significant ones include uh, design, uh, they're, they're fairly uh, a recent inclusion, and also a natural light uh, and a residential amenity or nearby users um, of, uh, of neighbouring buildings. So uh, the government uh, bringing in sort of uh, very a bit a bit more detailed and a bit more uh, a bit more criteria to, for uh, for qualifying developments to uh, to meet. Um, so just moving to the change of use, Geraint. So the, the final committee development uh, element that we we're going to touch on is the new class MA. Uh, I think we'd probably all say that uh, the agency side of SAM will see this as a, as a real opportunity. Um, it deals specifically with a change of use rather than, uh, rather than built form. Uh, so you may require planning applications alongside or listed building consents alongside um, uh, uh, proposals that you're dealing with through this route. But I think it's worthwhile saying alongside this, th there's been significant pushback by various members of the industry, um, both from a design side, also from a planning side. Uh, so Reba and the RTPI have pushed back against this because of what they see as uh, one, the risk to the high street, but also the the, sort of the wide ranging nature uh, that this introduces. And there is a legal challenge uh, against the introduction of, uh, of this use class. So uh, keep your eye on that, because if you do start going down this route, there is a chance that the rug gets pulled from all, uh, under us all. Uh, at some point in the not too distant future, at which point the government would need to reassess and reintroduce, assuming it has an appetite to do that. Uh, but just to touch on this very quickly, um, so as part of the government's overhaul of permitted development rights, Class O, which was the class that related to the change of use of offices to residential uses, has now expired, uh, and Class MA effectively replaces that. Uh, so touching on the use class change that Sean highlighted earlier, uh, class E is the amalgamation of A1, A2, A3, B1, A, B and C, D1 and D2. So obviously refer back to your notes on the, uh, and the, the, the chart we had on that. Uh, but the intention is to allow flexibility of uses without the need for planning permission, particularly to provide greater mix of retail, leisure and business activity. Uh, and the government wants to see more people living in, in town and city centres. So it's part of the government's response to the difficult difficulties that city centres are having, uh, particularly against current planning policies, which are uh, in the main drafted uh, sort of 10 to 20 years ago, if not longer, and are very protectionist. This is to allow the high street and our landlords to respond very quickly to, uh, to changes in circumstance. Um, they are capped, uh, so in terms of a single planning unit, it would be limited to 1,500 square metres, so still substantial. Uh, but you may find, and one thing that's worth understanding is that planning units, you could have what appears to be a, built, a single building on the outside. It could be determined to be a single, to have several planning units within it, if you've had different occupiers of different floor space. So again, the kind of thing that you probably need advice on just to make sure whether you are or aren't breaching that 1,500 square metre limit. Uh, the buildings need to be uh, vacant for a period of at least three months, but that, there is nothing to prevent a landlord from artificially triggering that uh, to achieve that, that target. Um, and it must have been in a qualifying use for the last two years. Um, there's also the prior approval process, which we've touched upon, 
uh, and you'll find that different local authorities are having different reactions to this. So uh, some local authorities uh, are, are supportive of potentially bringing vibrancy to the high street. Others may use uh, the prior approval process to, uh, to prevent schemes coming forward. Um, so if we maybe move forward, I'm conscious of time, so we move on to the next slide. Uh, yeah, sure, sure. Just to touch on the MPPF changes. Yeah, so, um, uh, yeah, just uh, as Gareth said, mindful of time. So uh, this summer, the the, uh, the government, uh, well, sort of amended or revised the, the, the current national planning policy framework, uh, which is the overarching national guidance um, for, uh, for for planning and, and new development in, in England. Um, so just very quickly, the, the sustainable, the, um, the government uh, included, incorporated the, the 17 uh, UN sustainable development goals, um, uh, placing a real emphasis on the sustainability and climate change in planning and development. Uh, and we're, set, we're starting to see that be reflected, uh, especially here in Bristol. Um, these still remain high level objectives, however, uh, which do lack metrics on climate change. Um, so it would be quite ambitious for, for local authorities to implement metrics at the local level. Um, the, the, the overarching social objective uh, of the, the planning system has also been updated, which adds uh, the government's other core theme to, to the, uh, the, the MPPF changes, which is uh, design and beauty, uh, which I'll go on shortly. Um, but uh, the social objective has been updated to promote well-designed, beautiful and safe places. And also the, the famous uh, presumption in favour of sustainable development uh, now uh, requires all plans to promote a sustainable pattern of development, which is, uh, in, in our view, a tightening up of, uh, of the, uh, the presumption. So on to uh, design and beauty. Uh, the language is, as ever, uh, ambiguous. Um, the, there is the, the creation of uh, high quality, beautiful and sustainable buildings and places are now considered to be fundamental. Um, so that uh, signifies the government's uh, shift towards uh, the, the aesthetics of, uh, of, of the new development. Um, councils are now required to prepare design guides and design codes consistent with the National Design Guide and uh, mod National Model Design Code. Uh, this is as a result of the Building Beautiful Commission's recommendations uh, and that is now incorporated within paragraph 128 of the MPPF. Um, landowners and developers may contribute to these exercises but uh, they may also choose to prepare design codes in support of a planning application for sites they wish to develop which is in one two, paragraph 129, um, but um, uh, where local codes or design guides are not available, the National Design Guide or the Model Design Code should be used to guide decisions on applications. So that's uh, something we've got to be bear in mind. Um, it just remains to be seen whether this will be a burden to developers or indeed councils, which are uh, significantly under-resourced at the moment. So just touching on um, uh, strategic uh, development, um, actually, let me just go, let me just uh, quickly go back. Um, the reference towards tree lined streets um, is, is, is a really quite a significant one uh, that we've, we've highlighted. Um, there is an expectation under national guidance to deliver such, such a, as I said, tree lined streets. So um, there, are, there will be significant implications on this notably uh, highways matters, uh, those on uh, those developments on fairly narrow streets or quite tight and constrained sites, uh, but also EV charging points also, um, which will uh, subject to secondary legislation in 2022, which uh, EV charging infrastructure will have to be integrated into all new re residential development very soon. So, Strategic development, so uh, just uh, very uh, quickly on this one. So strategic policies now uh, for new settlements and significant extensions now have to look at least 30 years ahead to take account into account timescales for delivery. So this will have, uh, as the slide says, the implications on uh, delivery and funding of infrastructure, uh, so housing trajectories um, and long-term, medium and long-term 
uh, housing land supply issues as well. So uh, just on uh, article four directions, um, so uh, these essentially remove permitted development rights within specified locations. So you will therefore need to uh, apply. So in an area with an article four direction, um, subject to the, the detail of that uh, article four direction, you will need to apply for planning permission instead of uh, applying for prior approval uh, for the change of use of a building or for your relevant proposals. Um, uh, paragraph 53 provides some updates to uh, Article 4 directions. Um, uh, so in our view, that's been tightened up. Um, the MPPF refers to avoiding wholly unacceptable adverse impacts, which is a pretty high bar. Um, and the council councils will need to justify that through evidence, through a set of robust evidence. Um, and also um, the, the Article 4 area should apply to the smallest geographical area possible, which when you can see on your screen, um, one this this Article 4 direction refers to a change of use of residential properties to, to houses of multiple occupation in Bristol. This is quite a sizable area you can see on that on that screen there. Um, so they, they, the Bristol City Council are gonna, in, going to need in future uh, to uh, apply to the smallest geographical area possible in, in that uh, respect. So uh, if I may just move on to the, the general uh, planning matters with Garand. Okay, we, we just wanted to highlight a few sort of common themes that we're seeing uh, across the country really, but uh, we're talking about them in a southwest angle. Um, so we've got five there, I'll just try and rattle through uh, in five minutes or so. So the first one, which you'll all be very familiar with, stretched local authority resource. Um, so it, in particular, looking at our, in the local area, uh, well, I'd say all four local authorities in and around Bristol uh, are struggling with this to, to some degree. Um, and it's not just in planning, it's also urban design, highways departments, all those people that feed into the planning process. Uh, there's a lack of resourcing. Uh, partly, that's the, there was an issue with funding and able, being able to compete in the market. But wider than that, I think the market is, uh, because of the boom we've seen, particularly in residential area, uh, over the last 12 to 18 months, um, the, the market is operating at a level that is way beyond what the council is capable of dealing with. Um, so, for example, in Bristol, um, uh, even signing officers to applications, it, in some cases we're seeing it taking two to three months just for an officer to be assigned. So when you think about the statutory targets for eight weeks for minor applications and 13 weeks for majors, there is no chance of that being met when an officer isn't even being allocated in the first two to three months. Uh, we are finding that those applications which have some political drive behind them or political buy-in, uh, there is an opportunity through those on, on major schemes uh, to pay uh, PPAs, so, so that's a planning performance agreement where you pay additional funding beyond your application fee for uh, certain targets to be met by officers. But even on big important schemes for the city, um, that's still not being delivered. They're just not engaging with that option unless it's something that they really want to buy into. Um, sustainability and climate change. Uh, so obviously it's there's a national agenda to that, to combating climate change. But on a uh, local level in the southwest, authorities are really taking that uh, seriously. So sustainability is, is a hot topic. Uh, and it's been incorporated into draft policies in the, the Bath and North East Somerset emerging plan, uh, uh, there's authorities declaring climate emergencies. Um, uh, recent changes to the MPPF now incorporate the UN's uh, global goals for sustainable development. So that's addressing social, economic and environmental objectives. Uh, at Bristol city level, for example, they're looking to demonstrate UN sustainable development goals through new development. So that's climate change and sustainability been arguably the biggest issues uh, in planning and development in the city at present, uh, not least because of the Green Party's emergence during the last elections and the power 
they hold, now hold in the decision making process. Uh, so Labour are trying to respond to that uh, by being seen to uh, to deal with those issues. But it, we are still getting mixed signals. We had a scheme recently, or there was a scheme that went to committee recently, which was for redevelopment of a car park uh, associated with Bristol Zoo. You'd think uh, urban site, um, a, a car park, uh, and developed at a density not significantly different to what was happening in the surrounding areas, but it was politically really challenged. Green Party objected to that, uh, and every every Green Party member on the application voted against. So uh, quite interesting to see those different political dynamics. One thing is said very vocally um, uh, in terms of general principles, not necessarily seeing its way through into practice. Uh, nutrient neutrality you may be familiar with. Uh, it's a particular issue at the moment for Somerset, Wiltshire, Herefordshire and Cornwall in our area. Uh, Natural England are concerned about the wildlife impacts resulting from excessive amounts of nitrates and phosphates in the water system. And so that's uh, uh, hitting development planning particularly hard. We've got caught up in that issue and effectively it's putting a moratorium on development uh, preventing councils meeting their housing targets, including housing land supply, until there's a solution there that developments can be seen to either contribute, contribute to or deliver on site. Uh, and that's not yet resolved, but uh, it is moving forward slowly, but it's in the hands of the authorities to deliver solutions that we can all engage with as developers. Um, uh, there was an interesting article actually on the BBC Country File, uh, and it did highlight that over 30,000 homes are currently being hamstrung by that issue across the country. Um, this is a very current issue in the event that you or your clients may be affected by nutrient neutrality matters, particularly phosphate issues. Uh, do either get in touch with us or contact the HBF because they're uh, advancing on behalf of the industry wide. Uh, trying to find a way through this. But it's a huge issue at the moment. Uh, in terms of build, 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 so that's all changed at national level. The government's white paper reforms towards boosting the housing delivery, incorporating zonal planning, are continuing to stagnate. So there was a lot of government rhetoric when that was originally uh, released, but it's not seeing its way through into deliverable policy. Um, and obviously, uh, we've seen the departure of Robert Jenrick and the arrival of Michael Gove. So it'll be interesting to see how that uh, changes play. Um, so there's a mixed view across the industry. Uh, CPRE have publicly expressed their support for the move. Uh, clearly, a higher profile individual uh, who is very popular with his members. Uh, so that's in terms of Michael Gove being appointed. So we'll see how that plays out. It's likely that the proposed reforms to planning are likely to be delayed till after Christmas, but I'm sure they'll get a lot of public uh, attention through the press. Um, and then finally, biodiversity net gain, uh, the Environment Bill, uh, which incorporates a legal requirement for all development to deliver what's known as a measurable biodiversity net gain, is making its way through Parliament. So there are some local authorities that are already engaging with this, but if you've not come across biodiversity net gain, uh, do take time to, to read some of the articles. There's a lot out there um, just to get a touch as to what's happening, um, but it, it will become a legal requirement and that's about um, making sure uh, as best we can in our industry uh, to, to resolve some of the harms to biodiversity that we cause through development. Uh, some of that will be about finding solutions off-site, but clearly there's an expense to your clients if that's the solution. Um, so I think that takes us to the end of our presentation. Hopefully we've, we've just about dealt with that in time. Uh, Sean and I are happy to uh, answer questions as best we can. Anything more detailed, we're happy to pick up after the presentation separately. Uh, th thank you, Garen and uh, Sean. That was a great presentation, uh, really thorough. Uh, uh, let me just scroll down to some of the questions. Um, so we've got a question in from Neil. Uh, what use class is a holiday let? Is it C3 or does a holiday let have to be self-contained to be classed as such or is it classed as a BNB? It depends in the way it's which it's used. So um, uh, 
holiday let, strictly speaking, uh, uh, well, is a residential use. Uh, so it's the manner in which you you operate that determines whether it's it, it's strictly um, a residential use and be should be treated as permanent residential or whether it can be treated as tourism. So I've I've had some uh, detailed experience of this where you tend to have a planning permission granted and it's restricted by conditions or or in some cases by section 106 agreements so legal agreements that sit to the side of your planning permission. Um, so it's the manner in which you intend to operate it or determine whether you're complying with your planning permission or not. Um, so for instance, uh, I've got examples where uh, things are being dealt with as tourism, but you've got pretty much the same occupiers in there for the best part of a year because they're seen as being um, uh, sort of in, uh, business occupiers that have a separate main dwelling elsewhere, but but for work reasons are based somewhere for the best part of a year, they can go and operate and that would still be treated as tourism. So each case you need to look at uh, uh, on its merits, really. Um, we've got another one. I know it was mentioned earlier. Hopefully you'll recollect um, what I was referring to. What is qualifying use? I think it was Garrett, you was talking about something about qualifying use earlier in the talk, in the presentation. So is this talking about the um, the uses that might be um, uh, that that you might be able to apply? I think this was when we were talking about the uh, the MA class. That's it. Yeah, yeah. That's uh, it. So so what uses might fall within uh, MA as a starting point that you might be able to change? So this kind of ties back into maybe Sean, if we go to because this is talking about class E changing to C three. So if we go back to the, uh, there we go, to the use class order, you can see the amount that becomes class E um, there. So the, there's a, a lot of coverage. So uh, uh, it's you know, shops, financial and professional services, cafes, restaurants, um, offices, R&Ds, light industrial. So there's a lot that gets caught by that. So as Sean says, we will share this so that you can see it uh, and start to play through. But this is why uh, it's always useful to have someone sense check before you're giving a client detailed advice about whether they can or can't and they they commit that financial um, uh, they make that financial commitment to that development project that site it, it's also worth uh, reiterating what Geraint said about uh, MA as well because this is what's getting our, our, our colleagues a bit excited the agency colleagues a little bit excited which is which is great um, but it, as long as it meets the detail and the restrictions um, the, the main one being at the 1500 square meters of, of, of qualifying of floor space uh, being the maximum level on a, on a planning unit um, that's one in, in our view one of the main uh, sort of requirements that uh, development has to meet. Yeah, uh, I think it's worth saying that as well because you, uh, obviously, the majority of your members uh, have a design focus. This is uh, obviously it's worthwhile understanding how that building can be laid out, but this is principally a process for changing the use. So it's a bit of a paper exercise, um, and you would need then separate planning commissions to deal. So we, we were talking about this early on. You know, if you've got a new entrance onto a street scene that you need to be able to make sure that this works independently, maybe of what's going on on the ground floor, or if you need to change some of the externals in terms of window arrangements and those kind of things. But it at least gives you confidence or the client confidence in principle before they start playing around with that more nuanced and expensive design process. Yeah, uh, we've got a question in from Neil. Uh, my local authority are very, very, very negative regarding class Q. Uh, for example, they accept that ex external walls can be constructed, but won't allow foundations to be constructed to support them. What is your uh, general experience on this matter? I think we both dealt with uh, class Qs and, uh, and I've seen different experiences with different authorities. So um, uh, given that we're, we're focusing on the Southwest day, Wiltshire, I know has a particular rep reputation for not allowing things through that uh, that others might uh, and this is where the the difficulty becomes because in a lot of planning law um, you would uh, in large-scale residential schemes things like that 
you end up with people with enough riding on the line to push these through to appeal or through the courts to get clear answers where authorities are uh, are using um, uh, matters which are to a degree slightly subjective, but they're using them to, in a particular way to achieve uh, their their preferred outcome rather than applying them in a standard way across the country. Um, and so you are having to be mindful of what the experiences of, uh, of particular authorities uh, before you commit to it's just so a client's going in with their eyes open. Um, there is that appeal process at the end, but if you're going to go to an appeal process, make sure that you you've put yourself in the best position. So that might mean doing some repair works to the building before you again engage the planners in the process, uh, because often repair works might not need planning permission. There are things that you could do which might not be hugely expensive, but will just make it more difficult for authorities to say no. Yeah, just to just to add to Geraint's point, actually, the the one the one I've been dealing with in Her Herefordshire, um, they being a predominantly rural local authority, they are quite hot on it. So uh, what we're finding is it's a fairly large a local authority as well. Um, but um, do take a if you can take a look at any local examples, um, and and have a look at how uh, that that has been applied in the decision making and the consideration of that that prior notification change has has been uh, applied in that scheme um, uh, and so it, it does vary per local authority as Geraint has said. Okay great um, uh, we've got a question in from Rob please could you expand on the motivation motivation behind class ZA demolition and replacement uh, obviously with it being limited uh, to so the zone in which buildings are built. So uh, 1989, is there a motivation for, is the main motivation improvement in energy performance or what, what's your sort of gut feeling in regard to why this has come through? Yeah, it's a good question. So, um, I'll, 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 um, I'll jump in. Uh, it's, a, it's a good question. Um, and I think it, it could well, it could well be energy performance, um, it meets, meeting energy standards. Um, it's it's something that we could we could go back and take and take a look at in terms of that specific requirement. I think a lot a lot of these. I mean, in terms of the the government's motivation for doing it in the in the first place, um, I, I think there was there were examples where poor uh, buildings, both in terms of energy and performance, but also in terms of, uh, uh, sort of their contribution to the street scene. Um, there were there were reasons why that wasn't converting them wasn't the best thing to do uh, in terms of end result but permitted development allowed you to go there uh, so having solutions like this might have a better result and uh, so I think it's fair to say that um, uh, sort of the longevity the life of the building through energy performance and other issues um, uh, is part of it but uh, also the design that it would deliver um, you know, do, is it something you know, this idea about good design being absolutely integral now to planning it should always have been but it's it, it, it's voiced more clearly now um so i think it, it talks to that as well uh got a very racy one so i wonder i wonder what your guys opinion is on it um uh, uh when building control consultants uh, were permitted to practice and rival that of the local authority building control it was a game changer. Can we pressure for at least some of the local authority planning departments to be privatised? I've never heard of planning as being uh, classed as racy, in a, but yeah. <laughs> um, it's, um, I think to a degree this is already happening, uh, but it's happening in a subtle way where local authorities are under-resourced and they're going out to external consultancies to provide planning support. Uh, so for instance, from our team here, we provided support to Bristol City Council on some major uh, call-in inquiries where they didn't have the resource to go away from their day-to-day -day job. So this was cases where the Secretary of State has called matters in effectively. It's, a, uh, it's an inquiry, it's so a formal process with barristers representing all sides and it goes into huge amounts of details, huge amounts of preparation. Uh, so rather than try and take people away from day-to-day 
uh, uh, planning performance uh, with applications. They brought us in to deal with that as a bespoke matter. Uh, we also did the development control role for the Brabus and Hangers uh, scheme, so very significant for the city. Uh, and again, it was a resourcing point. Uh, and in that case, the, uh, the applicant was willing to pay a planning performance agreement which met the additional cost of the council of bringing in uh, an external consultant. So it, it's, it operates in a slightly different way, uh, but it's, uh, it's a way in which they're trying to plug the gaps. Uh, but if, if I'm completely honest, um, private practice is, is stretched significantly as well. So it's not like there's a huge amount of resource uh, uh, available to local authorities unless they're paying the, paying the going rate. So uh, what local authorities are having to do is, is go to developers if they want to go down this route and say, you're paying your planning application fee, but if you will cover the cost of an external, then that will help things to flow through a bit more smoothly if they've got access to the right resource. Um, and so go, thank you for that. Got a question in from Rob. Do class Q and class R conversions still exist under the new rules? Uh, class Q does. Um, class Q does. Class R. I. Yeah, I was of the understanding that it it might have been revoked, but we can go back and uh, let Rob know the definitive answer of that. Yeah, um, that when we circulate these slides, we'll come back on that one for you, Rob. Yeah. Great. Uh, so, uh, Rob, if you um. Uh, you could also get in touch directly if there's something site specific that you're you're considering. Uh, we've got a um, uh, interesting. Uh, so yeah, so we've got a question in from Andy, probably very much similar to a previous question, uh, but not the one we just had, the one beforehand. Um, uh, interesting that in some authorities it's taken up to 12 weeks to assign an officer. Um, so it's just almost like a, a, a statement. Um, in my experience, I feel like there's a few, uh, I, don't, I don't know what the right word to use without it sounding negative, um, uh, methods um, to 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 uh, create additional sort of spread out, spread out the resource, I guess. That's the, the simplest way to put it. Um, we've we've personally had sort of uh, a very sort of tapered contact. So, for example, gen generic contract via the local authority site, and then therefore that will be then processed through to the case officer. Obviously, this reg registering and then asking for extensions of time and so on. But be interested to hear your thoughts. Well, what we're finding is uh, um, that we're having to advise clients um, that this issue exists, although they're, they're, the majority of them are well aware of it, but not the to the extreme that we've reached recently. I think the reason that the council are not allocating officers are just to say that it's, it's a way of highlighting to the industry the, the pressure that they're under. You know, there's no point it's being sat in their inbox if they've got no ability to deal with it during that time because it, it just gives gives us all somebody to chase. Um, but I, I think the, um, the, the sort of the, the reality of it is that we all need to be more mindful of, uh, of opportunities for appeal uh, because once you've submitted, submitted your application and it's a validly made application, even if it's not been registered formally, even if it's not been allocated an officer, after the relevant period of time, you've got the opportunity to, to take that matter to appeal uh, and the planning inspector uh, will then be required to deal with it. So you can you effectively get yourself into a position of, dirt, of sort of twin tracking, submit an application. If it's not dealt with in its appropriate timescales, appeal it, submit a, a duplicate application so the council have something in front of them to determine. But there's a backstop for your client that eventually the appeal will work its way through the process. Uh, so it depends how confident with, with the scheme you are, whether, you know, obviously it's nice to be able to negotiate uh, and make sure that the scheme is something that officers are broadly comfortable with and you, you've narrowed down the issues, but uh, it's an alternative and it's something clients should be mindful of. Mm. Um, uh, uh, there's a few points that we raised before we started the talk formally. Um, so uh, interesting one is um, the, I'll just bundle a couple of things together. Um, uh, there's obviously, uh, for example, in our region locally, but I presume is a uh, 
pertinent to countrywide affairs is that we have um, a, re a review of the green belt in Baines at the moment um, and then additionally we also have which does come up in quite 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 a few local authorities uh, is the inability to actually meet the five-year um, uh, development uh, land supply um, element of uh, things um, you tend to find it more of a issue in smaller um, Air, uh, smaller um, towns etc but it's actually come to the fore in Bristol um, which is quite interesting I'd be, I'd be interested to hear your uh, response to those two elements. Sure do you want to touch on BCC in this uh, this refocusing? Um, did you uh, the, just, just picking on the the urban refocusing in uh, uh, moving oh, uh, field? So, 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 on in terms of in terms of the the, the green belt as, aspects, um, so Bristol City Councils, um, it, it's there's a there's a technical issue and there's a, there's a, there's a political uh, side to this. So I'll go over the technical issue first. But um, so through the through the West of England um, combined authority, as you'll all know, uh, that the the uh, the spatial development plan uh, kind of fell flat on its face uh, with with the lack of evident evidencing, and one of those. Uh, one of those um, uh, strands was to uh, increase densities and focus on the uh, focus on the urban areas, and we're seeing that push through uh, through this uh, current strategic development, uh, the, the, the spatial development um, plan um, going coming forward uh, in very early stages at the moment in in Weka. Um, so uh, Bristol City Council are, are trying to uh, really pursue. A, a policy of, of, of densifying uh, their sites. Um, they, they have been looking at tall buildings, building building upwards. Um, so uh, they're trying to make the use of, of delivering brownfield homes and then therefore reducing pressure on, on, uh, on, on the green belt uh, around uh, the cities. Bath is a little bit more tricky because of the World Heritage Site designation, um, but that, that is what Bristol are doing at the moment. Politically, um, as Geraint said, the, the Greens party are, are really um, pressurising the, the um, uh, Marvin at the moment in terms of uh, delivering uh, green, more homes on Greenfield and Greenbelt land. In fact, in fact a, a couple of weeks ago, uh, we saw full council vote uh, for a blanket ban on, on Greenfield and Greenbelt development. Um, and, and pushing all development to, to brownfield sites. Um, and also more recently on BBC Radio Bristol, uh, Marvin uh, recommended that uh, a yew tree farm in Benninster be, uh, be uh, protected from, from all development um, as a result of a green party pressure. Uh, and that site was actually allocated in the, uh, the, the, lo the adopted local plan for residential development. So uh, there is a technical aspect to it uh, in terms of uh, urban intensification and also a political, quite sensitive side uh, to it uh, here in Bristol and Bar. I think the, the difficulty we've got is that the, the, that broad positioning doesn't always see its way through into decisions on applications. So the, the messaging where we're obviously getting, as Sean's just alluded to, is let's find urban areas, let's go up if we need to, let's deliver as much as we can within Bristol's um, uh, boundaries. So the pressure of Bristol being a successful city isn't pushing out into the green belt and the surrounding authorities or, or no more than it needs to. But the reality we're finding is you go in with applications for tall buildings, uh, you know, Bristol relative to other regional cities, doesn't go as high as other regional buildings, uh, other, as other regional cities in terms of the height of buildings. Uh, you know, it's not unusual in other uh, in other regional cities to be 30, 40, 50 stories, and we don't have that. You know, we've got Castle Park View, which is recently is, is sort of in the process of being completed, um, but there is nothing really touching at those levels. Um, so it's interesting to hear. The, the general commentary and then what plays out in planning decisions. In terms of the housing land supply aspect, um, it, that they're all interrelated. Um, but I understand Bristol is uh, unable to demonstrate a five-year housing land supply, um, but some of the local authorities around it are. 
Um, so inevitably what we're going to see is a bit more pressure on those surrounding local authorities to, to deliver uh, Bristol's uh, housing need, uh, particularly in terms of uh, affordable homes, which um, Mar Marvin Rees continues to, to pledge. But um, unfortunately, there has been uh, a, um, uh, an under delivery of, of, of affordable homes. Yeah, and that goes to the, uh, with Baines reviewing its green belt, you know, all the authorities in this area are in the process of bringing forward emerging local plans. So they're all looking at how to distribute new development at the moment. OK, great. Um, uh, I'm just going to uh, uh, we're going to bring the uh, event to a close. Um, I'm just going to share our screen and just highlight um, this event. Uh, uh, but by the way, also, uh, obviously, I know that there's been quite a lot of Southwest sort of Bristol centric sort of discussion. However, this is very much applicable to any other um, conurbation town, etc. You just need to almost use the same principles and look at your local area and understand exactly what issues there are. So, for example, the things that we just highlighted right to the latter end is obviously look at the housing supply issue. Is that actually being met? Um, green belt reviews uh, and so on and so on. All of these items are completely transferable. I, 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 I'm sure that uh, Garen and um, Sean will agree. Um, so um, thank you again from Garen and Sean from, of, from Savills uh, to for doing the talk uh, uh, on planning and regeneration update. Um, our next talks that we have coming up, our two final talks for the year is Autodesk CPD in 43, the journey from design automation and generative design on Wednesday 13th of October. Please do sign up to that. And then our final talk for the year, which I'm which uh, is going to be a really interesting one, uh, very much similar to the talk that we've had today, which should be going into much, much more detail about fire design. It's from Hydrock, uh, who specialise in um, uh, fire design and consultancy. Um, so we've got fire design, uh, fire safety design, current guidance, legislation and common design issues. So that's on Wednesday, 17th of November. That should either be on Eventbrite or about to be launched on Eventbrite. Um, there should be links circulating for both. Um, and we did have some questions from people asking whether the um, the slides will be circulated. I believe they will. Um, what we'll do is we'll use the Eventbrite mechanism to actually share that. Uh, if you um, uh, do not receive it, then please just contact uh, Site Wessex uh, uh, committee and we should be able to forward that straight across to you. Um, but thank you again, everybody. Thank you, Garrett. Thank you, Sean. And thank you to all of our attendees. I uh, hope you have a great rest of the day and uh, look forward to seeing you at our next talks. Thank you all. Thanks very much. Cheers.